these inequities and disparities, these injustices already existed, but they have been further spotlighted and exacerbated under this current administration. And that's why we see a crisis within a crisis within a crisis. And I'll just end on this point here. No one should be saying they look forward to the day when we can return to normal. Because that normal, that status quo normal, was an unjust and inadequate and insufficient one. And so I know that I'm offering a lot of, you know, heavy stuff here, but this, I hope the silver lining in this is that we construct a new normal. Um, so thank you again so much for joining us. Please tweet. Please, um, thanks to everyone who's following on Facebook and Twitter as well. Um, you know, I always say we want to amplify the message. So if you hear something you like, say it and amplify it through your social media streams. Um, and without further ado, we're going to kick it off. Um, so as you know, if you are here tonight, it's because you care about streets and you want to talk about what's happening on streets. But as I, I jump in to ask um, and introduce our first speaker, you know, um, I was, when we were prepping for this conversation, one idea really came to the surface. Um, you know, Linda said this, she said, I feel like we're talking a lot about streets, but we're not talking about the people who use them. And so that's what we're gonna center on tonight. Who are we trying to serve with our street interventions? What are the problems we're trying to solve? And, and, and then how do we design interventions that speak to those issues? And I cannot think of a better person to kick off this conversation um, than our, our partner, um, Congresswoman Presley. I almost called you um, Counselor Presley because we have been working with you since your days in the Boston City Council. And my very first meeting with you, um, I went in with my long list trying to convince you and you stopped me about a minute and you said, I already got it just tell me what you need me to do. <laughs> um, and so whether you are co-chairing the Congressional Bike Caucus, launching a Transportation Caucus, um, or rocking it, we know that, that you are solutions and mission driven. Um, so thank you for being with us tonight. Um, and my first question to you is really just, what's going on in the district? Um, you know, what's going on with your people? Give us a sense of what the biggest priorities are right now. Yeah, well, first, I just want to thank um, the Livable Streets Alliance. Thank you, Stacey, and WGBH Forum Network for hosting uh, this street talk and giving me the opportunity to speak about, uh, from my vantage point, uh, not only as a lawmaker and the congresswoman for the Massachusetts 7th, which includes Boston, Cambridge, Somerville, Randolph, Everett, Chelsea, and a little bit of Milton, um, but also as just a member of community. You know, I know that that's how all of you come at this. You're not, um, you're advocates, but that's informed by uh, your love of community um, and in caring about um, what I think is central to all the work we do, uh, justice for our communities, for your neighbors, for our neighbors. And so I'm really grateful for the opportunity to come together while we're physically distancing, but making sure that we're not socially isolating, that we remain connected um, continue to build community and not letting our advocacy uh, in the midst of COVID-19, which is dominating everything as well it should, in any way stall um, our organizing and mobilizing efforts. Um, so what am I seeing? Unprecedented hurt. Um, you know, I find myself heavy and just grappling with the gravity and the scale and the scope of what we are seeing and what is an unprecedented crisis. And then it is a crisis within a crisis, within a crisis, within a crisis. Um, it's not surprising that the highest rate of infections are in low income and communities of color, that um, African American and Latinx communities are being hit hardest by this. We know because of unequal access to health care, because of the comorbidities of structural racism and the, um, the collateral consequences of that resulting in underlying conditions, which has been informed by environmental injustices, by transportation injustices, by food injustices, by housing injustices, which is why I started this by saying that, you know, justice is really central to every single social challenge that we're working uh, to address. So what I see is just unprecedented hurt. Um, 
and I'm working every day to center the humanity and the dignity and uh, of every individual, of every family, of every worker, of every um, small business owner, and people, you know, I think we're, uh, what's the date? Because it just all completes together. I think in two days, the rent is due. That is top of mind for people. That's why I continue to fight for um, federally across the board, the cancellation of rent, uh, the cancellation of mortgages, moratoriums on evictions and foreclosures, the canceling of student loan debt in Massachusetts. There are 855,000 federal borrowers and they're saddled with a minimum of $30,000 worth of debt. Um, so people are just, um, again, managing the public health crisis and just trying to stay alive and keep their loved ones safe and healthy while also managing an economic crisis. And again, how we see this playing out has confirmed our worst assumptions of who would bear the brunt of it. And although COVID-19 is not a virus that discriminates and anyone can catch it, there are communities that are more susceptible and if they do contract it, will suffer the most severe consequences. And we see that playing out. You know, Boston, the African-American community makes up 25% of the population, but 40% of those uh, infected with COVID-19. Uh, we see what is happening in Chelsea. Those numbers have doubled and that is, um, you know, um, a, how, has been characterized as a hot spot. And we see Randolph trending similarly. Now, is it coincidental that where you have done so much of your work and what was the basis of your 64 um, hours report uh, that this is also where we see the communities being hardest hit? It's, it's not surprising. It is infuriating, but it is sobering and devastating confirmation. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, it's not it's not a cheery update. Um, it's tough, and uh, I our team just threw in the sixty four hours report. If you're not familiar with it, which shows which um, bus routes have you know the the worst service um, in the Metro Boston area, which frankly it goes through your full district <laughs> up to Chelsea, you know, through Roxbury, through Mattapan. Um, I mean, you know it, you, you've, you've rid, ridden those buses. Um, and I just want to say one more thing to that point though. The other reason why we see black and Latinx communities and places like Chelsea and Randolph and Hyde Park and Mattapan and Roxbury bearing this brunt is also because Black and Latinx folk represent and dominate the essential workforces. And so when you're talking about ridership, we have not seen the ridership really decline in these communities. So again, it's no coincidence that the same neighborhoods and municipalities that you've been doing your work in and where you have been most focused on, um, those same bus routes that were identified, that's where we see the greatest hurt. And so the, the data bakes up, backs up that demand for better sidewalks and more frequent services to decrease transmission and to allow people to continue to distance themselves from other riders and pedestrians. So this is, there is an, there is an intersectionality in all of these um, structural impacts. Yes. You're already leading into my next question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I, I know you have a tight time tonight and I want to respect your time. Um, and then we can switch to their speaker. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask my, my next two questions together. Cause I feel like you're just going to roll into it okay. anyway. So, um, you know, I, one thing that I, um, just have really respected is that you are working with our state senators, um, Warren and Markey to try to get federal agencies to release COVID-19 data on testing, on treatment, on fatality, is for race, ethnicity, and gender. And as you've noted, we have some of that information in Massachusetts, but we have folks from all over the country, some in rural areas, some in, in major urban areas watching tonight. And so I just want you to share a little bit about why it's so important. I mean, you've already talked about it, but why we need this, this sort of demographic okay. data. And then, um, you know, you're, you, you also are a leader on our infra infrastructure packages and the bills that are coming out of Washington. So, you know, tying it to getting the information, making progress in Washington, just sort of share your thoughts on this. Okay. And um, 
And I know I appreciate you wanting to be respectful of my time, but I'm going to stay for as long as I can. And I promise, I promise not to filibuster. I'm just excited to be in <laughs> with all of you. And um, I do want to say on the data point, because <clears throat> I think sometimes people can glaze over um, and, and be atrophied by, you know, lawmakers talking about data all the time. In livable streets, you know the importance of data. Mm-hmm. It, it directly informs where you are able to, to push for those infrastructure investments. And so even if you know anecdotally, based on your conversations with riders or with uh, bicyclists about where are vulnerable places and where are their gaps. You know that anecdotally because people tell you that, but you still need to collect the data. And that's what informs um, the sequencing of these investments, right? And it helps to better substantiate your case. And so the same is true when it comes to COVID-19. I began banging the drum very early um, and was not alone in that. You know, again, our senators uh, Warren and Markey uh, joined me in that, but I was banging the drum early in the need for us to collect racial data in real time, to disaggregate it and to publicly report it. Now we were already collecting age and gender. So there were some 30 states that were just collecting some semblance of data. And what that showed us is that uh, men were being infected at a higher rate. And so it's nothing onerous to overlay that already that collection of age and gender to then include race and ethnicity, to disaggregate it and to publicly report it. Now, why does that matter? It's not data mining for the sake of data mining. It's data mining for the sake of saving lives. Because due to the criminal negligence, the science denials, and the sluggish response of this administration, we are in the worst position you could be in in a pandemic, and that is behind. So we are playing a mean game of catch up. And so the data allows us to save lives because when that data is married with resources, we can follow where the trends, where the hot spots. Um, we can get to those most vulnerable communities and we can do mobile testing and antibody testing and, and address other, other uh, issues. You know, if you look at a community like Chelsea, which is in my district, um, more than 1,800 cases have been confirmed, making the city, the state, biggest hotspot, right? And again, many of the residents of Chelsea represent our essential workforce, um, have higher, suffer from higher rates of asthma and under underlying conditions. Um, and also, um, I spoke with one family, it was 12 people in, a, in a, uh, a one and a half bedroom apartment. And so even as people were presenting with symptoms, they couldn't physically distance. And so once you have the data, it allows you to ring the alarm in such a way that now the resources can be directed, marshaled, and coordinated um, accordingly. One of the things we had to fix in this last relief package in Congress is that the PPE and the medical equipment was being directed based on population. That was the algorithm instead of being based on an algorithm of highest rate of infection. And so that was something that we, we addressed in the last package. But again, you see Chelsea being hard hit and you see Randolph trending in the same way. And again, it's sobering and devastating confirmation, but it's not really that surprising. Please just you know recognize that these inequities and these disparities that inform my run, right? From Cambridge to Dudley, you know, uh, from Cambridge to Nubian Square, life expectancy dropping by 30 years, median household income by $50,000. So these inequities and disparities, these injustices already existed, but they have been further spotlighted and exacerbated under this current administration. And that's why we see a crisis within a crisis within a crisis. And I'll just end on this point here. No one should be saying they look forward to the day when we can return to normal because that normal that status quo normal was an unjust and inadequate and insufficient one. And so I know that I'm offering a lot of, you know, heavy stuff here, but this, I hope the silver lining in this is that we construct a new normal. Think about if we already had universal health care, if we had universal paid leave, you know, just starting with those two, if folks were working at a, liv- a livable wage, you know, how might we have better weathered this storm? And so we can't return to a new normal. This is the time to reset and to usher in a new paradigm. Yeah. 
I'm like all inspired, but we got to keep going. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna take one. I'm gonna take um two more minutes. Let's talk about transportation. Let's talk about infrastructure. Yeah. 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 No, I'm gonna, I'm gonna end with one more question and sort of bring it home because this is you're doing exactly what what we wanted to do tonight. You know, we were talking to you and talking to others. Is that, um, you know, I'm gonna bring it back a couple of year years ago. You and I got on on the bus with our partners at Green Roots Chelsea, who are slammed right now, right? Like every single day. Um, but we got on with their youth um, and got on the 111 bus, which travels across the Tobin and is every single day carrying our key transit workers. And another thing for this audience to know is that it is illegal to walk and bike across that, that bridge. So the only way for these folks to get in and, and to continue to work is to get on that bus every single day. Um, but I know that, that your personal connection to transit has really inspired the specific work you are doing, you know, rooting, rooting your work and knowing exactly what the community needs has inspired the way you are approaching um, transportation um, at your job. <laughs> um, uh, and so I just wanted to end with you sharing a little bit about how you're thinking about, you know, centering um, on, on our most impacted communities as we talk about transportation infrastructure stimulus, talking about bills, you know, all the stuff coming down the pipeline. How do we get it right and make sure that what comes out of Washington in terms of transportation serves those who are most impacted? Sure. Um, so first, I just want to say that one of my favorite memories uh, in defining moments in my freshman tenure has been the launch of the Future of Transportation Caucus and, and you and, and others from the district that came up to be a part of that. And, um, you know, I created this caucus in partnership with uh, two of my congressional colleagues, Representative Mark Chicano from California and Representative Chuy Garcia from Illinois, um, so that we could change, and again, in terms of a paradigm shift, the federal funding formula when it comes to infrastructure is antiquated. And it really contributes to the inequities and disparities that we've already enumerated in this street talk and that we live every day and, and we know exist. And it, it really is only for uh, highways, roads, and bridges and the extension, the extension of them, not even addressing maintenance. And so it isn't focused on multimodal infrastructure. It's not focused on buses um, or cycling or walkability. And so we created the Future of Transportation Caucus to disrupt this antiquated formula, which is contributing to social injustices and compromising everyone's uh, opportunity to have economic mobility. And so the Future of Transportation Caucus, and I want us to get swag. You know, Dennis, uh, my my, my uh, able uh, senior legislative aide here, you know, Dennis, take that note. We need swag. You know, come on. Do you all want a future transportation merch or caucus merch or what? Okay. But, um, but what we wanted to center in that or what we have is um, equity, accessibility, sustainability, and connectivity. And so um, the work that we've been doing is to directly inform the upcoming surface transportation bill. But some of that work will also be centered in upcoming relief packages. So we know the federal government has historically left so many people behind. And we do have a real opportunity to change the policies that have governed our transportation and our transit system. So this crisis has crippled the public transportation industry in which we are seeing a nationwide drop in ridership by 70%. And large transit agencies like the T are expected to lose millions of dollars from this crisis. Now, fortunately, the last relief package did provide some relief to transit agencies uh, in which the Massachusetts Department of Transportation received over $1 billion to prevent, to prepare for, and respond to COVID-19, with over $800 million of that going straight to the T. So this has allowed the T specifically to acquire PPE equipment, to increase cleanings of their facilities, their buses, their trains and trolleys. And I just want to take a moment to say whenever we're talking about cleaning something, you know, that's not like magic elves. Those are, you know, our custodial staff, you know, they are our heroes and sheroes too. Um, they're essential workers and they are putting themselves in harm's way every day, along with our um, our, our transit operators um, and we've heard really devastating stories out of New York where they have lost so many bus drivers um, and so many train uh, operators uh, because of COVID-19 and their exposure and not having the, the PPE. So the title of this street talk I, I know is a uh, um, how do we keep people healthy and safe on our streets? We need to remember that that does not just mean today. 
We have to plan for the future, hence the Future Transportation Caucus, and ensure the safety and the health of our state's mobility system, especially during COVID. So fixing the American Surface Transportation Act, the FAST Act, um, which is the piece of legislation that has determined our federal transit priorities over the last five years. Um, and I don't mean to get too wonky, but I, I think you know the, the audience can handle it. And that is set to expire in September. And so that's up for reauthorization. So as the co-chair and founder of the Future Transportation Caucus, we sent a letter to House leadership and the chair of the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee promoting the need for accessible, equitable, and sustainable transportation policy in that next reauthorization package. So again, although we are, you know, COVID is dominating everything as well it should, we're making sure that we see this as an opportunity to bring about structural change. And, and one way that we are going to, to leverage this opportunity for structural change and the work of the Future of Transportation Caucus is by uh, fixing America's Surface Transportation Act during this reauthorization. I should say um, the next relief package will be focused on infrastructure and recovery. So I also want to hear from you. What does that look like for you? Because, you know, personally, I think the definition of infrastructure should be completely expanded. Housing is your most expensive bill. You know, housing is infrastructure. Uh, multimodal investments is infrastructure. Broadband is infrastructure while we see the achievement gap being widened as we transition to online learning and better understand how many, who has access to a laptop and, and, and who doesn't. Water is infrastructure. I know folks think that um, lack of access to, to clean water is something that happens in like, you know, underdeveloped third world countries. No, it's happening right here. The folks in Flint, Michigan, many of them never got their water turned back on. And in Michigan right now, they are experiencing utility shutoffs, mm -hmm. right? Tribal nations that don't have access to water at all. And you're saying that the way that we stop a pandemic is by vigorously washing your hands, but you're doing utility shutoffs? Or you never returned people's water, to, uh, turned it back on and gave them clean water post the Flint water crisis? So, you know, I know that, again, I'm offering a lot of heavy stuff, but I do also want to say that there have been some things we've been able to secure in these relief packages, and, and those victories were only made possible because of the advocacy of people like all of you. So, you know, my, I find by the hour my heart breaks, but then it swells because this is unprecedented herd, but I'm seeing unprecedented community, unprecedented activism, and that people are clinging to unprecedented hope because we must. Thank you so much. Um, I, I think we're going to leave it on that note. I want to cling to unprecedented hope. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for your leadership. Um, I have an amazing evening, the best you can with your family. Um, and I'm going to um, turn as we transition. Um, thank you again. And really listen to what uh, Rep. Presley said, um, you know, as we discussed last week, now is go time on federal legislation. Like if you have not talked to your Congress people about what you need and what you want, like now is the time to do it. Um, but what I'd like to do now um, is say thank you and um, really build on this first part and welcome Naomi and Linda into the conversation with me. Um, you know, I know folks are probably here thinking, gosh, I was here to talk about open streets. And I would say is we are talking about open streets right now. This is exactly how you talk about streets, um, is talking about the real life context that, that people have and their real needs. And then we figure out the best way um, to, to bring them on. And I see Naomi. Um, I'm not sure if I have Linda up yet. Oh, yeah. Hi. Hi team. Um, so I, I know we're already running behind like we do, but you can't, you know, you gotta like love Ayana. Um, but I wanna take a moment just to introduce um, two of my colleagues from around the country. Um, Linda, who's at Active Transportation in Chicago um, and Naomi, who is at Nelson Nygaard. Um, and she's located in the Bay Area, but Nelson Nygaard is sort of all over. And I would just say um, both of these women I've had the privilege of working with for years um, are two of, I would say most of the talented thinkers when it comes to our streets in the country. So we are so privileged to have you both. Um, and I'm going to start um, with sort of an open-ended question and maybe, you know, ask you both to respond, but start with Linda um, and, and just say, 
You know, we already know that our streets and our transit are not serving people well. Like this is not news to anyone who's who's been in our universe. Um, but you know, the context has changed. We are in a, in a pandemic and we need to refocus our attention in the moment. Um, so, you know, I'm gonna start with you, Linda, and just say, you know, how do we shift our strategies and priorities to get it right on our streets? Yeah, that's a good question. And something that I've been thinking about in my work um, and in thinking about the experiences of people and how we are centering them. And as Congresswoman uh, Presley was discussing the, the city of Chelsea and Boston, which which I'm not from, but thinking about how we take the time to learn about the experiences of people, I think is really important. Um, yesterday, I, was, I listened to a really good segment on Latino USA um, around, around Chelsea and how uh, the mostly Latinx immigrant community is navigating COVID. So I think that's one step that I, I like to think about how we're taking the time to learn about the experiences of people that we don't understand. Because um, I, I think that's a really key step in thinking about how we're approaching looking at our streets. And one resource I want to highlight is uh, the Untokenings uh, Mobility Justice resource that we just developed. And for those unfamiliar with the Untokening, it's a national collective of multiracial uh, advocates uh, working towards mobility justice and um, equity. And we developed a statement on mobility justice recently and thinking about how we're centering the most marginalized as we're thinking about our streets, um, navigating it during a pandemic. Um, and one, one thing that someone highlighted during our call last month is how do we center essential workers um, in a way that's seeing them as sacred rather than sacrificial. And I think that question for me has really been framing how I'm looking at my work, how we see the work people are doing is really important and vital and not, not people that we can merely sacrifice because they still have to be going to work and exposing, them, exposing themselves to risk. Um, so I think that's a really key framing that I'm thinking about. And in our resource, we also developed the list of recommendations and in terms of what we can be doing um, as people in mobility and transportation, such as um, providing safety supplies for delivery workers, um, defining street safety in a way that centers marginalized communities. So thinking about the conversation about open streets and how we're moving away from a conversation that centers policing, because that's a very big concern for particularly black and brown neighborhoods that have been historically over-policed. Um, so, so we offer like a list of recommendations that might be helpful for people. And um, I think, I think the, thinking about how we're centering marginalized communities is very important as we do the work right now. Thank you. I'm going to ask Naomi to respond, but I do just want to point folks um, to the chat where we've linked to the untokening document and um, a statement um, from the Active Transportation Alliance as well. But Naomi, I'm sure you have thoughts on this as well. Yes, thanks. Um, so first, I just want to say thanks for the invitation. Um, also, how awesome is it that we get to be on the same uh, webinar as Representative Presley, so um, huge. And I, I guess I would like to say, as um, so, I work for Nelson Nygaard, as you noted. It's a, a, a consulting firm. We do work nationally. I'm based in Oakland, um, and I think through my work, and I have worked in the public sector and the private sector, um, as well as the nonprofit sector. So I have kind of a, a span. And I think that the area that we all agree on, um, and you know, I would say that there's a lot of alignment, but, but we start with problem identification. Um, so identifying where um, we see sort of the, the greatest opportunities or, or some of the biggest problems or issues. Um, and what we are seeing now um, in this context is that communities of color, specifically black and brown neighborhoods who have the highest um, incidents of um, COVID infection in most major cities at this stage, as well as morbidity and comorbidity rates, as, um, as the representative um, already mentioned, uh, are the communities and um, also serving much of the essential workforce. And so to me, just like we would, just like we would address any other problem, you start with understanding what the issue is, who is being affected, and then really targeting solutions in that way. So as it relates to our streets and as it relates to, um, you know, uh, communities that are being impacted, um, how and where can we provide interventions and solutions that are oriented around the data and serving those that are most impacted. Um, so I, I just want to, I say, I, I'm just really just underscoring what's been said, but I, I don't think that you can overemphasize that um, because it's really 
it's really important that we're utilizing that to, to make decisions um, and to, to drive decisions and the resources that come with them. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, and, and sort of shifting gears a, a little bit, um, because I do want to leverage your, your local expertise. Um, one thing that has really stuck out to me in a lot of the larger sort of transportation narrative is a, an excitement or a desire to take a picture from Oakland or take a picture from Milan and say, look, do this. <laughs> um, but then there, there isn't a lot of narrative around the data or exactly how the project is working or what inputs went into the project if it was successful. Um, you know, the, the example I would use is, is actually Milan right now. Um, they just announced a pretty um, substantial plan to really pedestrianize and increase bike access. Um, but what was lost in the narrative, I think, is that um, already 55% of the people in Milan take transit to get around. Um, and that their average um, commutes are four kilometers or less. So what that means is that what they're what Milan is really doing is is building using the information about their um, the people who live there to say okay um, we're going to overlay some walking and biking opportunities to 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 create physical distancing um, but it's really rooted in data and the reality that they exist in um, and so I'm using that as an example to say how how can we start having that conversation about every city that we're pointing to good bad or otherwise um, and I and I would love to um, flip it back to you, Linda, to just ask you, you know, I know you've been doing a ton of work in Chicago. It's literally your job. So um, could you give the folks um, who are watching tonight a sense of, you know, going beyond the headlines? Like, what are you hearing and seeing on the ground in real time? Yeah, that's a good question. I, and I think it's really important for people working in transportation mobility to think about what are the local contexts. Um, as you were saying, I think a lot of it has been driven by sort of these national headlines and we're seeing really different things depending on where you are. Um, so for example, just to give a little bit of context about where Illinois is, uh, Illinois' death toll from COVID passed 2000, 2000 this Tuesday and reported 144 fatalities. Um, and our curve is flattening, but that still means lives lost, which I think is something important to emphasize. And as you're seeing in the chat box, uh, the Chicago, Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning released some data this uh, last week about essential workers in Chicago and where they live. And unsurprisingly, essential workers live in greater concentrations, for example, on the south and west sides, among other adjacent areas. Uh, many workers live in low-income communities and essential jobs are dis disproportionately held by people of color. Um, and we're also seeing just news reports about the racial disparities uh, of COVID deaths uh, a few weeks ago, it was shown that 70% 70, 70 of COVID deaths um, are Black Chicagoans, which is are really significant facts to think about and something that um, has really framed the work that Active Transportation Alliance has been doing, uh, something we highlighted in our blog post and thinking about what the priorities are right now and how we are centering what is happening in our city and how it's impacting the most marginalized people. And I just want to highlight one more example of something, uh, something that occurred a few weeks ago in Chicago. A smokestack of a shuttered 95-year-old coal plant was imploded during a pandemic, leading to a cloud of dust enveloping the Mexican neighborhood of Little Village in the southwest side. Uh, now, in, in addition to concerns about the virus, community members have to worry about added pollutant, uh, pollutants in a community already suffering from pollution. And I bring this example because I think it highlights the challenges and years of inequities that make movement different for people depending on where you are. Riding a bike in one community in Chicago may mean breathing clean air with nice bike lanes, but in another community, it means having to be concerned about biking next to a factory and streets full of truck traffic. Uh, these contexts matter and they don't go away because of a pandemic and street interventions have to acknowledge these nuances if we're working towards equity um, and just ask ourselves really crit critical questions about how do people experience the streets differently and how does that impact how people utilize streets um, for their needs, particularly during a pandemic. Thank you. Um, and thank you so much for, for elevating that issue. You know, I, I was struck because there was so much chatter about open streets. Um, and there was, you know, in, in the news, if I wasn't connected to you, I didn't hear a lot about the smokestack, but you can't go out and enjoy a street if you, you can't breathe. So, you know, I think it really illuminates how we have to contextualize where and what the interventions look like. Um, and Naomi, you are, um, I believe, personally based in Oakland. Um, and so I would love to ask you just to sort of layer on to this part of the conversation around like, 
what are you seeing in your community? <laughs> yeah, so this is just me as Naomi um, and as a resident, a new resident at that um, here in the, the Bay Area. I previously was in Seattle um, up until February. Uh, so the majority of my time here now has been um, under shelter in place. And uh, so, you know, I think there has been uh, a lot of attention um, on the 74 miles of open streets that um, the city of Oakland, um, Mayor Libby Schaff um, announced recently. And um, I, I guess what I'll say about this um, is that, you know, it um, is a phased rollout. Um, uh, a number of the streets are shared. Um, and so it is, it's called slow streets. And, um, you know, it does have 74 miles throughout the city. Um, and there is um, sort of attention and focus on streets that are in um, uh, some of the low income communities, black and brown um, specifically. And I would say that it's, it's one thing to note is, is that it's on Saturdays. Um, it isn't like all the time um, right now. It's mostly um, uh, the sort of street pylons, the orange cones, uh, traffic cones, and then signage. Um, there is not enforcement. So um, that, you know, from a mobility justice and equity perspective um, is a, is a, a good thing. Um, how much engagement um, in advance of the, um, uh, you know, announcement went out, um, you know, I think there has been some post in terms of sort of they have a survey and evaluation, um, I think rubrics to to measure like how people are experiencing it. But um, it was something that a project that had been done um, in a different context. And so then this was a moment in time um, that the, uh, you know, I think the city saw um, speeds of vehicles that were out um, increasing on some of the corridors and thought, let's slow the streets down. Let's really bring awareness to the fact that there are more people because of this public health crisis and pandemic that are now um, activating our streets so that they can maintain a safe physical distance. Um, and so I think that's, that's all good. I mean, that's important to do. Um, I will also say that I think, you know, the streets were in fact, already being used um, in the manner in which they're being used. And so having sort of a greater awareness campaign around that, I think is, is important. Um, and I think that's part of what um, the 74 miles uh, sort of um, messaging has, has helped elevate. Um, and, you know, I think whether we're talking about open street, and this is for any city, because we know now that this is 100 miles has just been announced in New York City. Um, de Blasio's administration is going to implement that after a previous attempt um, that I don't think went as well. So they kind of went back to the, the thinking on that. But but the point is that whether it's open streets or whether it's transit, um, a transit oriented um, solution, I think what we're saying here is it's really important important to sort of start with like, what is the problem um, that we're trying to address? Who is most critically affected? And then how can that solution really support, right, the mobility and the safe um, mobility at that for folks that do need to be out? Um, so there's recreation and then there's actual, like we need to be out, you know, seven days a week, five days a week. Um, these are the times that we're out. Just like we calculate, you know, for peak, um, travel times, you know, and, and kind of address um, needs in that way. I think it's important that we are also thinking about that in, in the case of, of workers. And so, again, whether it's a st strategy around open streets or whether it's a strategy for transit service or emerging mobility solutions, um, it's really starting with where the, <laughs> where the greatest impacts are being felt um, and prioritizing, right? So I think there's a yes and that can be applied here. Um, but, you know, if it's a solution that's going to work for a select group of people um, and a majority, but a select group on a Saturday, that's a different type of solution. It's not a bad solution. It's just, it's a different kind of solution. Thanks. Um, I'm going to ask you guys one more question before I turn it over to Bob. And I really like your framing of yes and, because I think a lot of us, um, you know, the three of us and, and many others have um, felt that there's been a conversation of yes, no, open streets or no open streets. And that's not really what it, we're, we're saying or what is actually happening. It's more, you know, again, 
who's being impacted most, what is the problem we're trying to solve, and then what is the right fit solution. Um, and that um, in many cases, it's transit focused right now. Um, certainly corridor interventions are key for workers and that um, most certainly includes walking and biking. And I would just point the folks um, in the Boston area to how Brookline has approached this issue, which I think they did a really great job. They focused specifically on key corridors for um, folks who need to, you know, essential workers and critical areas like the Trader Joe's where people were, you know, flocking to the grocery store. And that is where they created their sort of distance on the roadways and removed that parking, put the cones out. And it's been very successful. So I think we have a really good local approach that was, you know, scalpel specific and designed to solve a specific problem for a specific population. Um, and so in, you know, my last question to both of you is, We've established a one size fits all approach does not work. Um, but, you know, I think that people are really hungry to understand like what options are most impactful. And there are a ton of people. I, I was able to look at the attendee list who are fired up. We had a boatload of questions about how do we get this? How do we get this now? And I want to know um, your advice for these folks who are really fired up. Like, what, what should they be doing in this moment to create the lasting change that they, they want? Um, and Linda, Naomi, I don't, I don't care who goes first. <laughs> uh, I really like the framing around identifying the problem. And I think, I think that's what I've seen is partly missing from the conversation at times. What is the problem and what solutions are we coming up with? And also I think it's important to think about who has the privilege to be framing their problems as the biggest problems, which I think is something that I think we all have to think about in, like in terms of people working in mobility and transportation, pe other people experiencing problems, they might, they might just not have a platform to talk about what they need. Um, and it's, it's really important to think about how we, how we can offer avenues for people to have those platforms and to like have their, their needs elevated as much as other people that might have more access and, um, and more opportunities to be having conversations in a, in a public setting such as like social media, Twitter. Um, so I think that's something really important that um, you both highlighted. Um, in terms of things that are really important to be discussing, my organization, the Active Transportation Alliance, has been focusing a lot on the need of transit workers. And that is going to be a need that's going to be there for a long time. And we're going to have to think about what is what does sustainable transportation look like in the long term? Um, so we've been we we've been talking since March since shelter in place, um, thinking about uh, getting uh, riders, um, getting drivers PPE, um, instituting rear door boarding, calling for um, free fares to limit um, interactions with with uh, drivers. Um, so we've had some successes on that front, and we're continuing to have conversations and and do advocacy work around um, just making sure that transit keeps running and it keeps working for people that still need to use it because we know that. There will be some people that are always going to be riding transit and we we won't transition everyone to walking or biking to work um, because there's just a lot of barriers for everyone to be able to have uh, that possibility be a reality anytime soon so we we need to be focusing our efforts on biking walking but also transportation which um which is kind of taking a hit because people think that and 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 rightly so in some ways that um, it's, it's just harder to socially distance. So I think trans, transit is just really important to be focusing on. And other things that I've been thinking about, which I don't really have clear cut solutions, but I always think questions are the start to solutions. So I've been thinking about how are we um, drawing from existing research and reports, which Stacey, I think you brought up in our last conversation, which I think was something that got me thinking, what exists out there already? Like plans, what have people asked for for years, but just haven't gotten? Um, there are a lot of plans, at least in Chicago, of like just so many engagement efforts. So how do we tap into existing research and um, make things happen for people, like for people in communities that have been asking for like street infrastructure for a very long time, even filling potholes, which are a big problem in my neighborhood of Little Village. Um, also, how do we address basic needs such as access to grocery stores? which we're seeing there's lines to grocery stores sometimes, at least in my neighborhood, and thinking about if we're talking about open streets, how are we, how are we using that conversation to um, address immediate needs in neighborhoods, creating more space potentially near um, services that are immediate for people, such as grocery stores, such as pharmacies, uh, medical services, and thinking about how we're also um, amplifying people's opportunities to get tested um, without a car, I think is really important. That hasn't really been part of the conversation. Not everyone has a car 
to um, get COVID tests. So I think those are some things that I've been thinking about in, in terms of leveraging the conversation around like open streets. How can we talk about it in a way that's um, tying into these immediate needs that haven't necessarily been addressed? Um, they're kind of ongoing. And I think there are opportunities for us to be having those conversations. Great. Um, and Naomi, I'm going to let you do this as we welcome Bob on um, to turn the tables on us. So Naomi, thoughts? Yeah, I think so two, maybe three things. I think the first thing is, um, and this is, uh, you know, I, I believe, I, well, you were already saying this, Linda, but I, I really do think that it's important for us to um, consider sort of the magnitude of the problem. And, and we've already been saying problem a lot, but I think the magnitude of the problem, and as Representative Priestley said, um, the complexities and the intersection of all of the injustices and experiences that people are currently having. What I will say as the Director of Equity, um, Diversity and Inclusion and Nelson Nygaard and in the work that I do before COVID, right? And, and on the untokening, right? In mobility justice, like before the pandemic, um, there was already a crisis. Uh, there was already a crisis in many communities, um, you know, and um, many communities are not whole communities. And so um, having open space for recreation, while that may be a really important thing um, and to be able to do that socially distance is, is important and, um, and a positive thing. Uh, I think that there are some like higher, like Maslow's hierarchy of needs um, that are really um, like crit critical and not being met. Um, and they weren't being met before, but now they're compounded, right? Because paychecks aren't coming in. Um, and if and when people are uh, going to work and they are essential workers, they're going to work exposing themselves, exposing their families. Um, their families are, you know, if they have children at home, presumably or possibly without um, access to uh, transportation or, or a way to get to food or to access um, health care if they need it. Um, if you have a myriad of um, different kinds of um, underlying health issues, there's a chance you probably need to get to um, a health center and or pharmacy, and that's also difficult. And so I think there's a way to think about our public space in a way that um, addresses sort of the hierarchy of needs. Um, and that can also include recreation, but again, it's about prioritizing and addressing the, the problems that are um, the greatest problems uh, at the moment. Um, and again, you know, that's just about having a racial equity and an equity framework. Um, at Nelson Nygaard, I did come up with um, a principles of its uh, public, uh, equitable public engagement. Um, I think you have that and you can share the link. Um, and that is a framework around engagement, but these kinds of frameworks, um, that framework can be adapted for um, really thinking through the kinds of um, solutions you're, you're looking to, to address. So if it's engagement or whether it's a decision around transportation, I think some of these can really be adapted. Great. Thank you. Um, and, and just in, in service of transition, um, for all of our talks, we've been inviting um, Bob C., who's a reporter at GBH on, to turn the tables and respond. Um, and we will be answering audience Q&A after this, and we can go a few minutes after 7. So if you put in a question a long time ago and you really want it answered, there will be time. But first, uh, I get to turn it over to Bob for a few minutes. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Stacey. Uh, Linda, I'd like to ask you about... Uh, making sure that the information that you get, the, not just data, but what people are telling you uh, during this crisis. Uh, I think public engagement is one thing, but being proactive and actually going out and seeking uh, people's stories and situations is really important. Um, so when you do go to make a decision or argue a case, you're basing it on you know what people are telling you. Now, people have told you things in the past. How is it changing now during this pandemic? What, what are the needs that seem to be really coming forward? Yeah, um, and we're still developing also like our outreach strategies. So I, I think like March is kind of, we're just all getting used to just the reality of like a really different context, uh, working from home, a lot of different responsibilities compounded around work. Um, but I have started, we started to have conversations with community partners. We're going to continue into May a, a little bit more robustly, but in conversations that I've been having, um, a lot of people have immediate needs such as like filing for unemployment. So one of our partners was saying that, yeah, we had to learn about how do I help people file for unemployment? I've never done this before, but we're going to have to figure it out or, or kind of deploying resources to help people 
uh, to help pick up people's prescriptions at pharmacies, which is like a critical mobility need for people that might not have access to, to go pick it up. So that's one partner that's uh, said that they were, they've been doing that as well. In addition to figuring out how to provide assistance for people that are struggling in terms of um, paying rent. So we've been seeing a lot of just immediate um, basic necessities from partners. Um, and in terms of like thinking about mobility and transportation, um, I heard I heard a lot of uh, support for um, like free fares, particularly one partner said, well, we some of us don't have income right now. How are we going to be paying for to use the bus uh, for people that have to travel? Um, so I think it's a it's a combination, at least from some of the conversations that I've had of immediate needs, but also on um, thinking about how we're um, making sure that public transportation is still accessible for people that just have very changing circumstances. And that would be my other question is that once people tell you about what they need right now, how do you think that will inform going forward uh, how it will change your thinking about what transportation needs are? Yeah, um, and we're still having a lot of conversations. So I, I think I'm, I'm trying to be really proactive in terms of like um, just being very um, okay with just learning and listening, which sort of seems counterintuitive to like pandemic state, um, which I, I think I've had to kind of retrain myself to, okay, I don't have to have the answer right now because I really haven't had a lot of conversations with people. And and though there, there have been um, some like reports that have been put out in, in the past around a lot of different issues and some of the issues are the same, some are just more amplified. The reality is that um, outreach is just a lot more difficult right now. We really can't have in-person conversations. We have to kind of pivot to figuring out what an inclusive online strategy looks like. Does phone banking come into play? So I think a lot of it's been also just strategizing how can we have good conversations with people um, and also keeping in mind that a lot of people just maybe this isn't their top priority talking to a transportation advocacy organization about priorities. Some of them have just other uh, needs, which I think I also try to be cognizant about, which I think Stacy does a good job of like acknowledging when we've talked, how do we balance the need to have conversations, but not overburden people as well when they have other needs as well. So I think that's something I've been trying to uh, keep in mind as well as I think about reaching out to people. Naomi, uh, when it comes to open streets, we've had an interesting experience here in Boston and Cambridge, and I'm sure it's not unique to us. But for some people, it's a great idea. For other people, it's the worst idea at this time. So how do you come down on whether or not a street you know, should be open to allow people to get outside and socially distance, as opposed to the fear that it's going to attract too many people? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, it's it's a, it's got to be, I have to just qualify this, like, I'm not a decision maker, I'm not a, you know, somebody leading a city or, or making those kinds of decisions, it's got to be really difficult. Um, how do you, you know, keep a population and community um, safe in a period where there is a, a, a virus, a deadly virus? Um, it's really difficult. But I do think uh, the kinds of um, again, just like looking at data, looking at, um, you know, how or where um, is there, and I'll, I'll, I mean, is there overcrowding? Is there a prevalence of people that are um, having to walk and bike and take transit at a specific time, um, you know, or a population that we see uh, where there is uh, currently a hotspot? Like, is that, you have to make an assessment, like, is it a safe decision to, to, to do that when you know that there's a higher incidence in that community and there's already um, higher prevalence and exposure rates. And so um, I think that the data helps inform, but I, I have to say when it comes to um, figuring out where and what the intervention is, I think you really do have to have both the quantitative quantitative data, but you also have to, you know, I mean, and it is a difficult time because people are dealing with so many needs, but there are uh, already, you know, communities that are um, providing services that are human service providers, um, and they might be good touch points and resources for figuring out, hey, what are the mobility needs of the folks that you're seeing, you know, whether they're coming to the food bank or whether they're coming for, um, you know, 
various types of services. Um, how are they getting here? You know, what are the means um, by which they're traveling? And um, when are you seeing them arrive? How far are those distances? That's the other thing. I mean, if, if people are living in far flung places, um, you know, it may be that walking and biking isn't going to get them exactly where they need to be if it's further from the locations where they have to go. Um, so I think these are all, I mean, again, I can't say this is the way you make a decision. I don't think it's, it's as we were saying earlier, it's not uh, one size fits all. Um, uh, I think there are a lot of factors, but certainly seeking to address like, you know, the safety and public health of folks first and foremost, um, especially those that are most hit, uh, hardest hit is, is the, the most important thing. And Stacy, uh, where we do have these open streets now, when we have the lack of traffic and all this wonderful space that people can use but are a little afraid to open up completely, uh, what happens when we, quote, you know, return to normal, whatever that is? How do we preserve the kind of good things that we see uh, that we're doing with streets now that uh, won't be overwhelmed by uh, getting back to normality? Yeah, great question. And I'm going to try to answer your question and some of the questions that I've seen come in around this about so many people are biking, so many great things are happening. How do we preserve this? Um, and I would say um, uh, twofold, uh, your perception of like, if you're looking out your window and you see a great open street and people walking and biking and you're like, yes, this is the future. It means you live in like probably a pretty privileged and like good context right now. And that there are many people in um, the Metro Boston area who, when we talk to them, they say, my life hasn't changed much. <laughs> I still have to go to work every day. The only thing that's changed, you know, my sidewalk's still broken. The, stig the signal to cross the street doesn't work. The only difference is that I get on the back door of the bus now. Um, and, and so I think even that framing of getting back to normal is context specific and worth considering in this moment around how do we actually move forward in a way that brings um, sort of equity on our streets along the way so that we are bringing walking and bike to those communities. But more specifically, um, I actually think that the more we can talk about transit in relation to the success of walking and biking, the more successful we will be. Um, because transit, um, you know, transit moves a lot of people. And one thing that we're going to cover next week um, with some folks who are going to bring an international, international perspective is that um, in cities that are opening up, car driving is going up immediately. And that's um, and that is related to fear around the transit system. Um, and so, you know, to, to more directly answer your question, I would say what we would love to see is an expansion of bike share. Um, and we've heard from some folks that making buses free and making bikes free or making those systems work together means that we can preserve and, um, you know, build out some of that bike network, expand bike share and have that overlap with key bus routes could be a really great potential solution to help preserve this and align with our goals. But that's like one corner of the equation. Um, and I think we really have to tie it back to transit, which we'll cover next week. <laughs> All right. Well, it's a big challenge, that's for sure. But thank you very much. I see we're at seven o'clock. So I'll turn yes. it back to you. Um, thank you. And we will take a few more minutes. I see most folks have, st have stayed on the whole time. Um, and we do have a lot of questions. So for folks um, who've who've sent in questions, I'm going to um, try to consolidate them. Um, but one of the questions that, a, a couple of questions that came up um, that I'm gonna throw to both of you is, you know, some concern around the role of policing. Um, so, uh, you know, someone asked, as we implement these slow streets, um, won't that increase the need for policing? Another follow-up question around, um, you know, is there, do, do city staff and elected staff in Oakland really have control over how Oakland PD does or does not um, uh, engage? And what I would ask you both is how, um, what role does policing have or not have in these questions? And, and um, you know, speak to that while I look through the rest of these questions and figure out the follow-up. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good question. I think, and, and I think that's partly informed my reluctance to, um, fully embrace this, uh, this topic of open streets um, and just getting context specific. Uh, like Chicago, it's, it's hard to imagine a context where open streets would operate without police in Chicago. I think that's just the reality of our city. Um, 
it's a different reality than Oakland. And not to say that there aren't challenges with police as well there. There, there have been a lot of cases that I, I would say nationally we can think about in terms of police abusing their powers, um, like Oscar Grant being one that comes to mind just immediately. Um, so I think that's something that I have a lot of concern about, especially coming from a family that um, grew up on Northwest Side, uh, majority Latinx neighborhood, and, and seeing how uh, the police interacted with uh, young men in my community, interacted with my family, my brothers, and and I, I, it's really important for me to think about people as I'm talking about these things and, and thinking about how those people are going to be interacting with the streets that I'm advocating for. Um, and it, it's hard to imagine a reality where I think, for, for example, um, just young Latino men in my community feeling the same kind of liberty of embracing a street close to cars as maybe other people with more privileges in other parts of the city. Um, and I, I think that's really tied to um, who, who has the privilege of seeing these streets as theirs to reclaim, um, which has kind of been some of the framing around this conversation. So I think it's really important to just um, center the conversation around the lived experience of people and how they're interacting with streets um, and how that plays a role in safety um, and just how they navigate um, public space um, kind of kind of tied to um, being police. So I think that's something that I'm thinking about and I have big concerns about. Um, so I, I think that in, in just approaching the conversation, that would be something I'd be really vigilant about and um, will always kind of advocate for alternatives uh, to policing. Great. Um, I'm going to try to throw out another question while we have it. Um, so we have received a lot of different questions around um, sort of exactly, um, I'm, so, I'm sort of reviewing these around um, Vision Zero questions. <laughs> um, and and I've, we've received some that are really specific. We've received, uh, so I'm going to try to summarize it. Um, some of them are asking for Livable Street's perspective on specific projects. Um, others are naming Go Boston 2030, which is the city's plan. Um, and they note that we still don't have a lot of data in terms of how the city is is measuring their their transportation goals, right? So we might have plans, but we don't have, might not have the bad data to figure out how it's hap how it's working. Um, and so, you know, and then other questions around um, our neighborhood slow streets program and how that's fallen off the agenda. It's all to say we have a, I'm looking at a laundry list of specific projects, some in Chicago, <laughs> some in Oakland, some um, that that folks want us to respond to. Um, and I guess um, what I, I would ask is um, from your perspectives, when when you are sitting and looking at, OK, we have a whole bike network to build. We have 50 slow streets neighborhoods. Um, we have parks that don't have safe access. Um, how, you know, how, how, how do you begin to respond to all of those needs in this moment? Um, and Naomi, maybe we can start with you and then Linda, if you want to add something. And then I'll, I'll try to wrap it up with one final question. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'll just, I'll go back to where we started. Um, and I think making the places whole that have not been whole. Um, prioritizing both resources, um, investments and um and time um because it will take time to to get from where we are to a place of recovery and healing and not not to normal um as uh as was noted at the beginning of the discussion i don't think that's um at least that's not the the focus if you're talking about equity and justice in, in the context of transportation so uh you know i think how do we prioritize um, and reprioritize given the reduction in budgets and reduction in likely staffing and reduction in um, uh, future revenues that are going to come in because we, as we know cities are, are funded um, by a variety of different revenues and so um, I think from an efficiency and um, from a you know um, sort of a, a prioritization methodology you start with like how how and where do we um, have the ability to to make things whole um, where are the gaps that have been gaps for a really long time and who are those communities um, that have uh, not benefited from past transportation investments um, and and I think I think that's that's how you go through um, those lists uh, you know it's not going to be easy there's a lot of really hard decisions uh, coming 
um, th that are already being made and that are coming. But, um, you know, having a really strong equity framework for making those decisions, I think, is going to be critical in the days, months, and years ahead. Great. Um, so my, my last question that I might also um, uh, try to answer a little bit is that, you know, I think I, I'm, I'm looking at one, two, three, four, six different questions about how do we keep the cars from coming back? How do we really prioritize walking and biking? Um, and I like I hear you, <laughs> everyone. I hear it. Um, and, you know, some questions around. So what are the best practices for scooters? What are the best practices for bike share? How do we really mobilize these things? And I think we've I think you guys have done a really good job of um, creating the prioritization matrix, right? Like, I don't think folks are gonna hear you say, okay, here, here's the exact five streets you need to work on right now. Here's like the exact bike share system. It's sort of like, here's, you now have the toolkit to go make these actions yourself. But I would say, um, I wanna wrap this all together and end on a hopeful note and say, um, what do you think is the best case scenario um, in like the, for the next six months? Um, and, you know, if you were in charge, like if you were in charge of your urban area and you were in charge of um, uh, how to fix the problems, how would you approach it and what would the world look like? Um, and then maybe we can ask everyone to think about that on their own as they seek their, their own path toward making walking, biking and transit a reality. So um, I'm gonna, Linda, I'm gonna ask you to go first and then have Naomi okay. have you close it. <laughs> no pressure <laughs> if I was leading a city. <laughs> Um, I think I'm going to go back to, uh, I think something uh, both Naomi and Stacy touched upon in terms of like thinking of thinking about public transportation is very key when we're thinking about walking and biking. And if I was leading a city or was put in charge of a lot of resources, I would think about how, how am I going to continue? How am I going to keep public transportation running? How am I going to keep people from that usually ride transit from getting in their cars instead. And that's a really big concern. Um, and I don't think there are any clear solutions, for example, like socially distancing on, um, like during rush hour on trains, I'm thinking of particularly like the trains I ride during rush hour. Um, those are really big challenges. Um, but I, I think we need to, we need to put our resources towards figuring out how we keep people riding transit safely. And I think safely is a really key term. Like it's not just to keep people riding for the sake of riding, it's to keep them riding because it's more sustainable and um, sustainable for our cities. Um, and how does that fit into a network of ex expanded biking and walking? Because I, I think there will be more people wanting to bike to work. I'm also thinking about, I usually ride the train thinking about uh, biking to work um, after shelter in place is over, but how, how does that tie into just continuing to make public transportation work as well? I think it's going to be a, a really crucial question for us. Right. And Naomi? Yeah. So I'm not in charge of anything. I've said that before, just qualifying that. Um, and I, I guess I'll frame it more around like, where do I see bright spots that I think, um, that I think can be expanded? Um, we're seeing, and it's already been mentioned, but we're seeing more um, free transportation. I think, Whereas um, in the past, right, the fare box recovery was a concern. Well, at this point, like fare box recovery is is like down in some cases 95%, um, in addition to other ridership and revenues. And so um, what we are seeing is that there is a desire to both support and retain the um, existing um, core ridership. And I do think that um, it's really interesting because now there is this, um, I guess recognition um, of this core ridership that has always ridden transit that will um, will continue to ride transit through a pandemic because that's the way that they get around. Um, and so ensuring that they have the ability to do so as um, Linda said, safely, but also um, free, right? To do that free and to have the back um, of the bus uh, boarding to keep the, the workers safe. Um, I also think that we're probably gonna see and, you know, um, you know, I, I think it's a bright spot, but we're seeing some service redesigns um, in real time that are starting to happen because um, service reductions were made um, responding to the overall right reduction in the system. But now what we're starting to see is a correction of um, some of those uh, reductions and actually adding frequency and um, 
adding reliability to routes where there is um, high or there is like a good amount of ridership um, because workers are ensuring that those stations and those because um, they're workplaces as well as they are transfer points and, and pickup stations. So ensuring that those places are you know cleaned and maintained and um, uh, I also think that there's uh, some real opportunity around partnerships, um, uh, innovative partnerships with um, emerging mobility who are also, you know, the private side of the sector is hit really hard. Um, but I think what we're seeing is, uh, or what we potentially could see and what we could help encourage is for those longer distances where people aren't necessarily going to walk, um, but maybe aren't going to um, uh, maybe can't take transit or whatever, they can potentially, um, or if they want to choose to ride um, bike share. So I think that we'll see some interesting emerging mobility partnerships um, emerge. Um, and I guess lastly, I'll say, you know, I think, um, again, in order of priority, like there's opportunity in like sort of every sort of avenue um, to create free, or sorry, to create like accessible, um, transportation. I do think there's going to be a lot of messaging that's needed um, and messaging that's really intentional that's deep in communities and, and really working much more closely or if not, yeah, like much more closely um, with a lot of human service providers who are doing frontline work um, with communities um, and ensuring that, you know, they're getting what they need. And there's probably even going to be opportunities for um, creating curbside. I mean, I'm seeing it already, but curbside pickups for food distribution um, so that people aren't necessarily having to go to grocery stores and wait in really lengthy lines um, where there are um, um, food deserts and things of that nature. So I think there's a lot of innovation that's happening. Uh, and I just want to shine a light on some of those. And I think uh, those are areas that, you know, I think could could and would serve to be expanded on. Great. Um, thank you both so much. I know that we covered a, a lot to let to uh, tonight. So I just want to encourage folks to copy those links out of the chat if you haven't already. I know we didn't get to everyone's questions, um, but I do think much of what folks have asked has been addressed. Um, and I would say we we do the reason why we're doing four of these is that we have time to talk about transit next week. I hope you guys heard loud and clear that our the success for our streets is really going to depend on our transit backbone. Um, and then we will have another conversation that's really Gonna, you know be able to talk about main streets housing and transportation so please come back please register please share those questions in advance um, and you know one thing that I, I would say uh, in closing is that um, this conversation what we didn't come with like a checklist of here are the five streets in Boston because it's not that simple um, and we have to have these big visions and these big plans and so I'd also say you know um, the more advocates and agencies can go through these processes of, um, of prioritization and the more we can be in lockstep, I think that's great. And um, I, I just thank you, Naomi. Thank you. And uh, thank you to WGBH for hosting us and letting us go over. And um, thank you to Ayanna Presley and the A-team for always having our back in these conversations. And I will see many of you next week at our Street Talk. Um, but for now, thanks for sticking with us a little late and have a good night. Mm -hmm.